I was sitting in my car surrounded by sand and soldiers when I received notice that I was divorced. We were married for almost four years. For almost a year and a half of that time, I was in a hot, dry country on the other side of the world. She couldn't take it anymore, and I understood her completely. I didn't even try to talk her out of it. Being a military spouse is the second hardest job in the world. Being a parent is much harder. My home was in Ponca City, Oklahoma. That's where I grew up, met, and married Lisa Thompson. We were each other's first love. She was the first and only girl I dated through high school and community college. After college, I left for the Army and she went to college and became a nurse. We married after she graduated and were stationed at Fort Belvoir, Virginia. We had been there a little over a year when I received orders to go overseas. Lisa decided to return home to Ponca City rather than stay at Belvoir. She started working at the hospital almost as soon as she arrived. When my year abroad ended, I returned to Belvoir and Lisa joined me. We had a wonderful 13 months together before I received orders to return overseas. Lisa returned to Ponca City again. Neither of us were happy about this second separation, but we realized it was due to military service. I had been in the country for about six months when I received a letter from Lisa informing me that she could no longer tolerate the separation. I married you to be with you every day and every night. We have been married almost four years, and for more than a quarter of that time, you have been half a world away. I can't live like this. Please understand that I love you, but this loneliness is driving me crazy. In this letter, I enclose the divorce papers. If you love me, if you care about my happiness, please sign them. I wrote her a long letter expressing my sadness that she feels the way she does, but that I totally understand her. I told her that I wanted her to be happy, and if divorcing me would do that, then so be it. I told her I love her and signed the papers. A few months after receiving the divorce notice, I returned to the States and was serving in Washington, D.C. at the Pentagon, which was practically next door to Fort Belvoir. She was still stationed in Ponca City, and I assumed she was working at the hospital. I was tempted to call her, but decided against it. Why open old wounds? I asked myself. I earned an associate's degree prior to my military service, and through hard work, correspondence courses, and classes at the University of Maryland, I earned my degree. It was Monday morning, and I had just arrived at my office in the Pentagon. I was sipping my first cup of coffee and checking my schedule for the day. The call came in at 8.45. My father had suffered a massive heart attack and died. By mid-afternoon, I was flying home. Ponca City has no commercial air service, so I flew into Oklahoma City, OKC, and rented a car. My brother Matthew, Matt, sister Tina, and their spouses were with my mom when I entered the house. Matt was on the police force and had been since he was 21 years old. Tina, like my mother, was a teacher. I immediately walked over to my mom, who was sitting on the couch between Matt and Tina. She saw me, and we both started crying. Matt got up so I could sit down and hug my mom. When we both calmed down, she told me that the heart attack happened while he was in the garage cleaning the insides of his pride and joy, his 1957 Chevy Bel Air convertible. He died in that car and didn't want it any other way. She was almost smiling as she said it. The next few days were spent making final preparations. Dad was a veteran, so the Army took most of the burden off Mom. We three kids didn't make any decisions. She and Dad discussed what each of them wanted, and she did just that. The only request she made of me was that I wear my dress uniform to the funeral. It was still hanging in my bedroom closet. I didn't need it overseas or in Washington, D.C., yet. It just needed to be cleaned and my ribbons and badges attached. The morning of the funeral came. My mom looked at me, walked over and brushed imaginary lint off my chest. Then she stopped, looked up at me, and kissed me. Your father was proud of you. Later that day, Matt and I stood by the casket and greeted people as they passed by. We hadn't been standing there long when Lisa, my ex-wife, showed up. I reached out my hand to shake hers, but she ignored it and hugged me. I'm sorry, Michael. To everyone, I was always Michael, not Mike. I loved your father. Thank you, me too. She pretended like she wanted to say something else, but she didn't. It was the end of the day, and the family was gathered at Mom's house, eating the massive amounts of food that friends had filled the kitchen with. Mom was incredibly strong during all of this. The sun was already setting when the phone rang. Mom and Dad still had a landline. Tina answered the phone. Hi. A pause. Hold on. Michael, it's for you. I took the phone from her and she looked at me and raised her eyebrows. Hi. I said. Hi, Michael. Hi, Lisa. That got the attention of the whole room. Can we talk? I don't think we have anything to talk about. You've made your decision, and it's probably better for both of us. I'm not so sure anymore. Well, that's water under the bridge. 
I've got an early morning flight, so I'm going to Oklahoma City soon. I'll be spending the night there, so I gotta go. Where do you serve? She asked before I could hang up. Listen, Lisa, I don't have a lot of time to spend with my family. Thanks for coming over today. Goodbye. I hung up the phone, turned around, and everyone looked at me. We're divorced. It's over. I'm fine. She's fine. I told them. Now I need to change and pack. I have to leave soon. Soon after, I received my bag and was ready to leave. There were hugs, kisses, and handshakes all around, and I finally made it to my rented accommodation. The next day, I was back in Washington. One of the good qualities I got from Lisa was an understanding of classical music, especially Beethoven and Bach. Another of the three Bs, Brahms, was never a particular favorite of mine. Two weeks after his return to Washington, the National Symphony Orchestra presented a program of some of Beethoven's works. Among them was the Bagatelle, as well as the Symphony No. 7, Apacer 92. It was an eclectic program that also included works by Copland and Bernstein. Tickets were hard to get, but the Washington Military District was usually able to get tickets to some of the larger events in the area. So I went to the Recreational Services Office and was able to get one ticket. The evening of the concert came and I went to the Kennedy Center. I had been there before and I really enjoyed it. The first half of the program was devoted entirely to Beethoven. At intermission, I grabbed a drink and returned to my seat. Other audience members were returning to their seats as well. There was a couple in my row who were walking down to their seats somewhere to my right. The woman was walking ahead of the man. I stood up to make it easier for them to pass. When the woman was directly in front of me, she stepped on my foot. Stiletto heels, if applied to the top of the foot, can cause a lot of pain. I shrieked quite loudly, causing her to lose her balance and fall on top of me, causing me to lean back in my seat. She, having lost her balance, fell into my lap. I have no idea how I managed to avoid falling or spilling my drink. We just sat there and looked at each other. I like just breathing in her scent. She was wearing taboo perfume. My ex-wife used to use it, and it always turned me on. How's your leg? She finally asked. Not bad. We sat like that for a few seconds, looking at each other, until she spoke again. You know, we're going to have to stop seeing each other like this. Why? I asked. Are you a pervert? She asked. Mostly. I like perverts, she said. We heard someone clear their throat. We looked over. It was her escort. She gave me one last glance and stood up. She smiled and walked down the row to her seat. At the end of the concert, we were all leaving the auditorium. I was behind her. I looked for her escort and didn't see him. I tapped her on the shoulder. She turned around and recognized me. Taboo? I asked. Yes, how did you know? It's my favorite. Me too. Where's your friend? He's somewhere behind us in the crowd. Your husband? God, no. A serious relationship? No. In that case, are you providing your phone number? Rarely. I'm a pretty rare type of person. She laughed. What you are is a pervert. You said so yourself. You said you liked perverts. I said I like some perverts. The people around us followed our conversation with interest. Some of them giggled and others, tisk, tisk, tisk. We walked across the hall to the front door. She paused. I'd better wait for my friend. Would you like some company? For what, 30 seconds? He can't be far behind. She laughed. In that case, I guess I'll be going. It was a pleasure to have you step on me. She laughed again. And I enjoyed spending some time on your lap. I laughed and waved, walking out one of the many doors. I looked, and she waved back at me. It had been almost a month since I had been to a Beethoven concert, and I was ready for a new one. It didn't have to be Beethoven. Just about any classical music concert would do. I checked the Kennedy Center schedule and saw that there would be a concert the following week featuring the music of Maurice Ravel. I went to the recreation office to find out how to get a ticket. There was one left there. I took it. When she handed me the ticket, she said, We were only able to get two of these tickets. The seats are arranged together, so you will be sitting next to the colonel's wife. I was a staff sergeant at the time. Privates and officers, even wives, rarely walk in the same circles. At my job, I socialize with two colonels and various lieutenant colonels and majors. At the Pentagon, captains and lieutenants were even rarer than staff sergeants. I never even met a colonel's wife. I didn't care, though, because I was going to listen to music. The evening of the concert came, I put on one of my two suits and went to the concert. I had already sat down in my seat and was reading the program when I smelled something. Taboo. I looked up and saw her. I stood up and spoke. I thought you said you weren't married. No. I was told that the colonel's wife would be sitting next to me. My mother is married to a colonel. 
She sat down and explained that her mother had gotten a ticket, but couldn't use it. By the way, my name is Connie. Connie Self. She held out her hand. I took it. Michael Carter. So, Mike, do you like Ravel? Mike. No one had ever called me Mike, but I didn't bother correcting her because when she said it, it sounded like, I want you to shake my brains out. I love. Especially Gaspard de la Nuit. We talked until the program started. At intermission, we had a drink in the foyer and talked some more. The program ended with Bolero, which some consider the most boring piece of music ever written, and others the most sensual. I belong to the latter. After it started, I glanced at Connie's self and caught her glance at me a couple times. Eventually, it ended, and I decided that if it had affected her sensually, she was hiding it well. I walked her to her car. She unlocked the door, and I opened it for her. She started to get in, but turned to me. Aren't you going to ask me for my phone number? I looked at her. I had asked her that the first time we met, but that was before I knew she was the colonel's daughter. Look, I said. I'm a staff sergeant. You're the daughter of a colonel. I'm sure your father wouldn't approve of your association with someone like me. Who says you have to interfere? Friendship is not defined by rank. That's not what I meant. What did you mean by that? I, uh, just... She smirked at my discomfort, got in her car, and drove off. Maybe you just screwed up big time with Staff Sergeant Michael Carter, I thought to myself. Three days later, I answered the phone at the office. Special Operations Division, Sergeant Carter. What can I do for you? You can help me by writing down ten numbers. She said in the sexiest voice I'd ever heard, and as she spoke, I could almost smell the taboo she wore. I beg your pardon? You heard me. Now write them down. She began to recite them, and I dutifully wrote them down. Now repeat them, she said. I repeated. Good boy. Now do you know what to do with them? I think I have an idea. Another good boy for you. Keep it up and you might get a gold star. Yes, ma'am. Don't wait too long. She hung up. My first thought was how she got my number. But then I realized that her father, like 30,000 others who worked at the Pentagon, had a Pentagon phone book. In the evening, I called the numbers listed. But there was no answer, so I left a voicemail. The next night, she called me. You weren't kidding, she said. You told me not to wait too long. She laughed. We talked. Same thing the next night, and the next, and the next. One night, however, was different. Are you ever going to do it? She asked. Do what? Ask me out. I'd love to, but... No buts, damn it. Either you want to or you don't. Which is it? I want to. Then do it, okay? Would you like to have dinner with me? Sure. When? Tomorrow night? Great. What time? Seven? Seven. That's right and she gave me her address. She lived in a two-room apartment. As she showed me around, she seemed particularly proud of her shoe collection. There were very few clothes in the guest bedroom closet. The rest of the closet was filled with shelves. On those shelves were shoes, hundreds of shoes, and she took great pride in showing them to me. I was glad she wasn't living with her parents. I still wondered how they would react to her dating a soldier. We dated for two months before we had sex. In fact, it was the same night I met her parents. She invited me to have dinner with them. She noticed my hesitation. Come on, Mike, they won't eat you. They're normal parents. Curious, of course, because I've never invited anyone over to their house for dinner. Do they know I'm enlisted? I spent most of the next three days with Ruth. Lisa stopped by a few times. She and Ruth talked about boys and how they would react to her scar when she put on her swimsuit. It's a very small scar, Lisa told her. Besides, when they see how pretty you are, they won't even notice it, Ruth glowered. The first Saturday after Ruth's release, my phone rang. I looked at the number, but didn't recognize it and didn't answer. However, the caller had left a message. Hi, this is Lisa. I hope Ruth is still okay. It seems like the time spent in the hospital is always worse for the kids. There was a pause. Can I talk to you, please? There's so much I've wanted to tell you over the years, but I've never had the chance. Please, Michael. I listened to that message at least five times before I called her. Hi, she replied. Hi, it's Michael. Hi. You wanted to talk? Not over the phone, in person. Okay. Mom's taking the kids to the lake tomorrow. Why don't you stop by my house around 10.30 a.m.? Or do you have to go to work? No, tomorrow will be fine. Where do you live? I gave her the address. Are you still drinking coffee? There is, but now decaf. Me too. She showed up at exactly 10.30, but she was always punctual. The coffee was already on the table when I opened the door for her. I thought she wanted to hug me, but she changed her mind. I showed her where to sit. 
She sat down, took a sip of coffee, and began. It was nine months after your first tour abroad. I was having an affair. I was without you and was looking forward to your return. Sammy Young saw me at the mall and spoke to me. Do you remember him? I shook my head. He was two years older than us in high school. That conversation led to another, and another, and another, and another. Then we moved on to drinks and dinner. After almost two months, I slept with him. Once, she sipped her coffee. When you came home, I was terribly afraid you would find out. But you were so happy to see me that the possibility of my cheating didn't even cross your mind. You may remember that we had a wonderful year together. I nodded in agreement. Then you went abroad and I came back here. You were only gone a couple weeks and he was already back. I have no idea how he knew I was back in Ponca City. The thought of being without you for another year was beyond me. Less than a month after you left, I slept with him again and continued to sleep with him for two more months. Then I found out I was pregnant, so I asked you for a divorce. I told him, and he left for parts unknown. I've seen him around town ever since, but we never talk. After I filed for divorce, I lost the baby. I almost canceled the papers, but I felt so guilty that I didn't. I tried to tell you what I did when you came home from my father's funeral, but you wouldn't let me. Cheating on you is the worst thing I've ever done in my life, and I regret it every day. I was selfish and greedy, and I can't find an excuse for it. I loved you when we were young. I loved you when I married you. And I loved you when I divorced you. All these years I have tried to avoid your family because I was ashamed. We occasionally bump into each other. But nothing more than that. Two years after our divorce, I met a man in the hospital. His mother was in surgery. We hit it off and were married a year later. Three years after that, we divorced. Since then, I've been focused on my work. Then I saw Ruth's name at the hospital. Like I said, I've been avoiding your family, but I figured if she needed anything, I could get it for her. I opened the door, and there you were. I am rarely surprised and never shocked. But when I saw you, I was shocked. I had no idea how to act or what to say. When I left her room, I walked down the hallway and broke down. I cried for two hours. I cried for happiness that you were alive and well. Then I cried for the stupid thing I did and for the love I lost. I took a sip of my coffee, which by then was too cold to drink it, as was hers, I assumed. I sat looking at her trying to think of what to say. I didn't know that she had cheated on me, of course, and I didn't know that she had gotten pregnant by another man while married to me. Finally, I spoke up. I don't know what to say. I always thought you divorced me because you couldn't bear our separation. But you tell me that the problem wasn't loneliness at all. It was the longing. I realize it's loneliness. I loved you enough to let you go because I couldn't bear the thought of you being alone. That's why I agreed to the divorce. But cheating is hard for me to accept even after all these years. The thought of you having sex with some man while married to me is something I can't easily come to terms with. I loved you enough to let you go. And while I was crying over losing you, you had another man's baby inside you. I stood up, reached out, and took her cup and went into the kitchen. I think you'd better leave, I said as I walked. Michael, please. Goodbye. She slowly stood up, walked to the door, opened it, and turned to me. Michael, I... Goodbye. Why in God's name did she have to tell me that? Does it matter after all these years? And why should it have such an effect on me? At first I was angry, and then I became enraged. For two weeks I stewed over what she had told me. Then common sense took over. Why should it matter? We had been divorced for several years now, and I no longer had any feelings for her. The end of the school year was approaching, and it was a busy time for me. So Lisa took a back seat. Big Jake asked if the kids could come visit him for part of the summer. I replied that yes, of course. Three days after graduation he flew in. We met him at the airport in OKC, and the children flew back with him. Their visit was to last two weeks. That was all Big Jake thought he could handle. I hadn't had much of a social life since Connie's death, and three years was a long time. Sure, a couple of women had come along in that time, but I still missed Connie. My brother and sister tried to set me up with women, but it didn't work out. I mean, there was no spark, no connection. My brother was by then deputy chief of police. One day he came to my house. I had just finished mowing the lawn and was sitting on the porch with a glass of iced tea. He came inside, poured himself a glass, then came out and sat down with me. We chatted for a few minutes before the real reason for his visit became clear. I shouldn't be telling you this, but since it's a matter of public record, I guess I can. We've arrested Lisa three times in the last few weeks for appearing in a public place while intoxicated. Each time my officers tried to bring her into the station, she slapped them and told them to get their hands off her, that she belonged to Michael Carter. The first time she said it, the officer thought it was funny and he told me. Then she said it the other two times as well. 
Her father bailed her out and the district attorney decided not to prosecute. When it happened again last week, she decided to go to an alcohol rehab program in Tulsa. She's there now. I shook my head. Why are you telling me this? Her father seems to think it has something to do with you. He had no idea you were back in town until Lisa first got drunk and talked about seeing you and your daughter. When she sobered up, he asked her about it, but she wouldn't discuss it. The last time he remembers her drinking was during your divorce. He told me that she is usually almost a teetotaler. I remembered that she and I had drinks, but very rarely. My question is the same. Why are you telling me this? Honestly, I don't know. It just seems like she's crying out for help, and you're the person she seems to be crying out to, or for whom she's crying out. I took a deep breath and told him about the last conversation I had with her. The Blessed Virgin Mary, he said. Do her parents know? I have no idea, but if she hasn't told them, I certainly won't. We talked until his radio started calling him and he had to leave. For the next three days, I mostly thought about Lisa and what she had done to our marriage. Loneliness versus horniness. Love versus lust. The more I thought about it, the angrier I got. I didn't owe her anything, so why was I spending so much time thinking about her? I had no idea, but the next day I called Lisa's father and asked if I could see him and his wife. When I approached, we shook hands, and Lisa's mom offered me iced tea. No one turns down iced tea in the summer in Oklahoma. I hadn't been to this house in years, but as I looked around, I realized that nothing had changed. What can we do for you, Michael? He began. I have no idea, I replied. I heard that Lisa was arrested and is in rehab, and I was wondering if there was anything I could do to help. To tell you the truth, we have no idea. Everything was going well until she was arrested the first time. That's when we found out you were back, her father said. We don't know what to do, Michael. She seems to be in a lot of pain and she doesn't want to talk about it. We're getting old, Michael, and we'd like to know what we can do to help her, but we just don't know, said the mother, taking her husband's hand and squeezing it tightly. Would it help me if I could see her? I asked. We've talked about it, and we're not sure if it will help or hurt, but it's worth a try, her father said. The next day I drove to Tulsa. I checked in at the front desk and was directed to her room. She sat in the armchair and looked out over the garden. She turned to see who had come when she heard the sound of the door opening. Her eyes widened when she saw me. Hi, Michael. I didn't think I'd ever see you again. Why? I decided you hated me after our last conversation and kicked me out of your house. I don't hate you, Lisa. I've never hated you, but I do hate what you did. She stood up, walked over to me, and looked me straight in the eye. I do too, Michael. I hate it with every fiber of my being, but I can't change it. So I've lived with guilt and self-loathing all these years. There were only a few days when I didn't think about it. Those days were few. But they were a blessing. She turned, walked over to her bed and sat on the edge of it. She paused with a detached look, then spoke again. Why are you here? I'm not sure. I talked to your parents and... She interrupted me and jumped to her feet. Oh my God, Michael. You didn't tell them, did you? It would have killed them. No. I didn't tell them. I sat down on the windowsill and looked at her. It's up to you if you ever want to. I'll never tell them. Never. They'll be crushed. She sat back down on the bed. It's up to you. There was a pause and she began to cry. Are you okay? I don't know. I thought I did, but now I'm not sure. I started drinking after our last meeting. I wanted to drown myself in alcohol because I thought that would make the memories go away. But it made them worse. Every detail came back to mind. She paused. Remember what you wrote in your letter when you sent back the divorce papers? Most of it. I remember every word. I still have it, and I've reread it at least a thousand times. You told me you'd give me a divorce if it would make me happy. It was all you wanted to do in this life, and the thought of me being single was hurting you. And if a divorce would make me happy again, you would gladly sign the papers. I've loved you since the day I met you, you said. Signing these papers is one of the easiest things I've ever done in my life because it will make you happy, and you signed them. I cried when I first read it, and I cry every time I read it now. She turned away and began to cry. For a long time, the room was quiet. I sat on the windowsill and watched her. I was powerless to help her. I wanted to cry a little myself. I stayed with her until it was time to go to dinner. She didn't want to go, but they made her. She acted like she wanted to hug me. But like before, she was afraid to touch me. When I left, I went straight to her parents' house. Why is she there? I asked. We don't know exactly. It was her idea. She said she had to quit drinking and they would help her. Has she ever had a drinking problem? Never. What got him started? We thought you might be able to answer that question because we don't know. 
I'm no expert, but I think her problem is that she's hiding from something. I think she should go back home. I don't think they can help her there. I gave my opinion. I agree, her father said. I'm not sure, her mother said. With your permission, I'd like to go down and see her again tomorrow. Of course, they said in unison. I was there early the next morning. She was having breakfast in the cafeteria. Her eyes lit up when she saw me. You're back, she said, smiling broadly. Yes. Would you like some coffee? Yes, I would, but not here. Where? At your parents' house. Why don't we have lunch with them? Are you serious? Yes. What do you need to do to check out of here? I don't know. Do you want to stay here? Not if you want me to leave. Then let's leave. We went to her room, gathered her things, and walked up to the front desk. I'm going home, announced Lisa. And we walked out. As soon as she got into my car, she called her parents. Hey, Mom, I'm on my way home. Pause. Michael is bringing me. Pause. We'll be there soon. Love you. Bye. The rest of the drive passed in silence. Neither of us said anything, but I could feel her eyes on me every mile of the way. It was like she was trying to memorize me in case I disappeared. It was like the day before, when she kept her eyes on me for most of the time I was with her. Her parents were standing out front when we pulled up. Lisa jumped out and hugged them like she'd been gone a long time. Why? How? Was about all her parents could say. Michael wanted to have lunch with you, so we came home. When are you going back? Her mother asked. Lisa looked at me. I shrugged. She looked at her mother. Never. I don't need them. We had lunch. Then we had dinner. It was almost midnight when I left for home. She walked me to my car. Thank you, Michael. You're welcome. Will I see you again? I don't know. Now I seem to be able to accept it, because for years I thought you hated me. You said you didn't, but I didn't believe you. But after the last two days I feel in my heart that you don't. Now all I have to do is to stop hating myself. She went back into the house. What am I going to do now? I thought as I drove home. I had to admit that the day I had spent with her had brought back good memories. But every time I looked at her, I saw her bulging belly filled with someone else's baby. Maybe the belly wasn't big, because I don't know what size she was when she lost it. But in my imagination, the belly was big. For the next few days, I stayed home and did yard and housework. That calmed me down. On the third day, I called her parents. How is she? I asked. Wonderful. She looks like her old self. She asked if I'd heard from you. Maybe I'll call her. I had her number when she called me. She's back at work today and won't be out until three. Is she still living with you? No, she went home yesterday. Good for her. At four o'clock, I called her. Hi. Hi, it's Michael. I could almost hear her catch her breath. Hi. I wanted to see how you were doing. I'm doing fine, Michael. Thank you. Listen, if you haven't eaten yet, would you like to grab a bite at Enriquez's? There was silence. Hello? Oh, I'm sorry, Michael. You just caught me off guard. I understand. Maybe another time. No, no. I'd love to go. I went over and over in my head, trying to figure out why and when I decided to take her out to dinner. But I never figured it out. We were able to have a lot of laughs and also reminisce about old friends and good times. When I drove her home, I walked her to the door. Would you like some coffee? I almost agreed, but managed to refuse, saying I had had a long day and needed to sleep. We cuddled up for the night. My children had been gone long enough. I wanted them to come home. I had talked to them and their grandfather a few times, and my impression was that they weren't ready to come home, and he wasn't ready to let them go. I grinned. I talked to Ruth and told her I wanted them to come home. Daddy, we can't come home yet, she said. Big Jake is taking us on a Disney cruise. We can't miss it. He's what? Let me talk to him. He picked up the phone. Yes, Michael? What kind of Disney cruise is this? It's one of the ones that goes out every week. The kids are going to love it. Weren't we supposed to talk about this? No, I'm their grandfather. I can do pretty much anything I want with them. It's written in the grandparents' handbook, but they'll need passports. Would you mind keeping them overnight? Don't parents have a say? No, not when it comes to the relationship between grandparents and grandchildren. Parents become livers. I laughed. Okay, Jake. But if anything happens to them, now he laughed. I've got it all figured out, Michael. Enjoy another week at your leisure. Maybe I'd rather have my own children. Tough shit. You lose. We both laughed. I forwarded their passports. Perhaps if they were home, I would have less reason to call Lisa. Anyway, I was able to wait two more days. Hi, Michael. Hi. I was wondering if you wanted to go to the JCC on Friday. There's a symphony playing there. 
It was Lisa who first introduced me to classical music. However, the program they were going to play had Beatles songs on it, but I didn't tell her that. I should have known because she knew. You know they're doing a retrospective of the Beatles, don't you? She laughed when she said that. It's okay. We don't have to leave. No, I'd love to go. We often went to OKC for the symphony and stayed the night each time. I wasn't going to spend the night with her this time. Friday morning came and Lisa called me. I can't go with you tonight, she said. I was tempted to ask her why, but I didn't. I figured she might give me the reason herself, but she didn't. But thank you for asking. It means a lot. Maybe some other time, I said. I hope so. Perhaps she has gotten used to me being around and forgiving her. Perhaps she has finally begun to forgive herself and is returning to the life she had before I came back. For the next two weeks, Lisa and I didn't talk at all. Finally, my kids were coming home. I drove to D.C. and met them. Big Jake flew with them. I tried to talk him into coming with us for a few days, but he wanted to come home. There were several tearful goodbyes. He and the girls were crying. Little Jake just stood there, embarrassed by the public display of affection from his sisters and grandpa. They didn't stop talking all the way home, and I learned more about Disney World and Disney Cruises than I ever wanted to know. Two days later, the four of us were at the supermarket shopping. With three hungry kids, food doesn't stay around for long. I sent Ruth and Carrie out to get bananas. A few minutes later, they returned without bananas, but with Lisa. Daddy, Ruth said. Look who I found. She was getting bananas too. Ruth remembered Lisa from her short stay in the hospital. Hi, I said. Hi. Are you okay? Yeah. Yeah, I'm fine. Okay. A long, awkward pause. Well, I guess we'd better move on. Let's go, kids. Sure, she said. Maybe I'll see you again. I watched her walk away, and part of me wanted to go after her and ask her what happened to us. But then I thought, there was no us. I was just trying to help an old friend who turned out to be my ex-wife. But what I really missed was the little time we had together. And I didn't know if I missed Lisa or my kids or adult female companionship and the good stuff that comes with it. My brother Matt has a wife. Her name is Rosa. Rosa has a cousin. Her name is Francesca. Francesca and I apparently dated years ago, but I didn't remember anything about it. One night, Matt and Rosa took me out to dinner. Francesca was there. It was a pleasant evening. Francesca was attractive and charming, but there was nothing about her that made me want more. I let Matt and Rosa know that their matchmaking was over for me. It wasn't that I didn't want to date someone. I did. One Saturday afternoon, my kids were with their cousins at the pool. I went to the park and sat by the lake. When I was younger, I always did that. It was my fortress of solitude. Even when the park was full, I felt lonely. I thought back to my life. Marriage to Lisa, meeting Connie, having an affair with her, marrying her, her death, my army career, and three wonderful children. I was a lucky man. I had loved two women, deeply and passionately, and had come to realize that was the only way I could love. I had gotten to the point where I no longer cared that Lisa had cheated on me. If we hadn't gotten divorced, I never would have met Connie, and I wouldn't have my children. The reason for the divorce no longer mattered. I stood. I wanted to get back to my kids. I turned and almost bumped into Lisa. I've been watching you for over an hour now, and you haven't moved once, she said. I've been thinking. That's what I thought. You spent a lot of time here as you were trying to figure things out. Yes, it is. You and I used to come here a lot and park over there. She pointed to a spot I remembered well. I remember. That's where we had our first kiss. I smiled. She tapped me on the shoulder. That's where you seduced me the first time, and I was just a little girl. Seduced you, my ass. You almost raped me. We walked over to the picnic table and sat down. It's been a long couple weeks, she said. I've missed you. Yeah, me too. You know why I couldn't go to the symphony with you? I've decided it's none of my business. That's your business. She paused. When we traveled, we stayed overnight. We'd get a hotel room and take wine and cheese with us. When the weather was nice and depending on what floor of the hotel we were on, we would turn off all the lights in the room and sit on the balcony naked, sipping wine and snacking on cheese. Then we'd go inside and make love. We always made love, I remember. That's why I couldn't go. I couldn't bear to sit next to you and listen to the music and know that at the end of the concert, we would come back here by car instead of going to a hotel. We sat like that for a long time before I spoke. I can understand that. But what's happened in the last couple weeks? Honestly? Yes, I don't trust myself around you. You just told me that I almost raped you over there the first time we had sex. To tell you the truth, 
I can barely keep from touching you whenever I see you. For example, right now, I could easily have sex with you on his desk, and I wouldn't care who was watching. We stared at each other for a second, and then averted our eyes. Then she spoke again. I realized that you would never love me again, never want to make love to me, so I stayed away. I, like you, come here to think. I've seen you sitting here, and I've just been watching you, trying to figure things out. I'd like to know what's on your mind. I'd like to think that if we spent enough time together, you could learn to love me again. But since we're going to be living in this town, I'll settle for at least appearing to be a friend. I like to think we're friends, I said. Me too. A long, empty pause followed. Well, I've got to go. I came here to think, but if I stay, I'll only be thinking about you. She started walking to her car. I sat down next to her and walked with her. Somewhere during the walk, we held hands. At her car, I opened her door, and she started to get in. Lisa, she stopped and looked at me. How many men have you dated since your last divorce? She looked at me. Three. You slept with them? One of them. Two times. She got in her car and drove away. I watched her go. I have no idea why I asked her that. It was none of my business and had absolutely nothing to do with anything. I drove home. It was the following Saturday. My kids were swimming with their cousins again. I was on the corner of 14th and Grand when someone ran a red light and hit me. I woke up in the hospital. My left arm was in a bandage. I looked at my mom, brother, and sister who were looking at me. My mom leaned over to kiss my cheek. She took my hand in hers. How are you feeling? It's like I got hit by a truck, my brother laughed. Actually, that's what happened. The truck and driver were on drugs. We put him in jail, my mom said. The doctor says you're going to be fine. You've got some bumps and bruises. And of course, a dislocated shoulder. But all in all, it could have been a lot worse. Later, my kids came to visit me. The girls were crying, and Jake was fascinated by all the tubes and wires. The girls held my hands, and Jake wanted to know why there was a bag of urine hanging on my bed. I tried to explain what a catheter was, but he didn't quite get it. Ruth, being the oldest, understood. But she wrinkled her nose and made funny noises as I explained it to him. It was late in the evening, and I talked everyone into leaving because I wanted to be alone. I was tired of the company. Dinner that night consisted of a cheeseburger and fries. By the time they got to my room, both dishes were already cold. I was hungry, so I ate everything, even though it was cold. They gave me enough pain pills to really feel no pain. I was watching TV when I saw my door start to slowly open. I watched as she walked in and stood by my bed. How are you feeling? I could be worse off. Are you able to get out of bed? I haven't tried. I don't think they want me to. Good. She leaned in and kissed me. A long, slow kiss that plumbed the depths of my soul and told me she really meant it. I've wanted to do this ever since I saw you here with Ruth. You can call the administration and report me if you want, but I did it and I'm glad I did. After I saw you at the lake, I decided I still loved you and if I was going to get my heart broken, so be it. Then she walked away. I stayed up until 2 in the morning trying to figure out what I thought of that kiss and her statement. I pressed the control button on my combo device, combining TV, nurse call, and bed control, and the top half of my bed lowered to a flat state. I knew I enjoyed her kiss, but I couldn't decide if it was because it was her or if I was so desperate that any kiss from any woman would have had the same effect. Eventually, I dozed off. When I woke up at 7, my mom was there. We did the usual, how are you, routine, after which she sat on the edge of my bed, took my right hand, held it up, and rubbed it. Then she asked, what's going on with you and Lisa? What are you talking about? I asked, releasing her hand and pushing the button to lift the top half of the bed and return to a sitting position. When I came in, she was sitting in a chair and sleeping, covered with a blanket. Had she been here all night? I don't know. It was already two when I went to bed. She wasn't here then. Well, she woke up a minute or two later and wished me a good morning. She threw back the blanket and said she was going to go check on your breakfast and then she left. That was 15 minutes ago. At that moment, the door opened and Lisa walked in with a tray of my breakfast. She set the tray on the small table and positioned it so that the tray was right in front of me. They had scrambled eggs but I said you like it medium, so they changed it. Do you still like it that way? She took the lid off the plate, and two perfect scrambled eggs stared back at me. I also told them you prefer ham over turkey sausage or bacon. She looked at me and smiled. Then she put the napkin on my chest and started cutting the ham and eggs. Then she took a piece of both with my fork and brought the fork to my mouth as if she were feeding me. What are you doing? I'm not helpless. That's pretty much the way it is. Your left hand is in a bind, and you're left-handed. You can't support yourself because you'll never be able to use your right hand for anything useful. So just open up like a good boy. I opened my mouth when my mom laughed. 
I remembered the cold cheeseburger and fries from the night before and didn't remember having any trouble eating, but I decided not to say anything. Oh, I'm sorry, Mrs. Carter. Would you like to do that? Still laughing, Mom said. No, dear, you're doing fine. I did my part when he was little. He's still little, said Lisa, wiping my mouth with a napkin. I ate everything on the tray and couldn't take my eyes off her. She let me drink my coffee alone. When I was done, she wiped my mouth again with a napkin and then kissed me again. When she left, Mom said, Michael, you have a woman in love on your hands. What are you going to do about it? I have no idea, I said, looking at the closed door. I stayed there for two more days and learned that she never left the hospital. She slept in the chair by my bed at night. If something was bothering me, she wouldn't let anyone else do it. The only person allowed to feed me was Ruth, who thought it was cool. Carrie did too. Jake found it funny. On the morning of my release day, she rolled me up to the exit where my brother was waiting to take me home. Call me if you need anything. She leaned in and kissed me again. This is getting to be a habit, I thought, as Matt pulled away from me. I looked up at him and a smirk appeared on his face. Not a word, I said. Not a word. He didn't say anything, but the smirk didn't go away. The first night home, I called her. I was hoping you'd call, she said. Thank you for your help at the hospital. Could you come over and help Ruth and Carrie make dinner? They want to, but they need a little help. She was there in 20 minutes, and I could hear her and the girls laughing as they made dinner. Jake didn't usually come into the kitchen, except to get something out of the refrigerator, but soon I heard him laughing with the others. At my children's insistence, she stayed and ate with us. After dinner, the girls volunteered to clean up for the first time ever. Lisa came into the living room to chat while the girls cleaned. Jake wasn't going to help his sisters. The girls finished and all three kids went to their rooms, saying goodnight and hugging us. Even little Jake gave Lisa a hug. Lisa and I talked. The kids showered and went to bed. Lisa and I were still talking. It was getting close to midnight and I was starting to get tired. Do you want to go to bed? She asked. A little? If you need help taking a shower, I'm willing to help. She smiled. I... Not in the shower, silly. I can wrap your sling so it doesn't get wet. I don't need a bandage. I'm not helpless, said I. All right, she said. I'll go home. She got up, grabbed her purse, walked over and kissed me goodnight. Staying awake and thinking had become a habit I didn't like, and this night was no exception. One of the things that kept my brain busy was that something about Lisa wasn't right. It wasn't until two days later that I realized what it was. She didn't smell at all like I remembered. In fact, all she smelled like was soap. Very nice soap, but still soap. And never any perfume. That's it. No taboo. Over the next few weeks, Lisa came to my house at least four times a week. The children got used to her cooking dinner and eating with us. I liked it too. I was informed that I had been given a permanent teaching position and classes would begin soon. I had completely forgotten about clothes and supplies for the children. The supplies were taken care of, but when it came to clothes, even Jake didn't want me to go shopping with him. One morning, we were discussing it at home and Ruth said, Lisa knows more than you do, Dad. She can help us. Maybe she's not free. Call her. I put it on speakerphone. Her cell phone rang. Hi, Michael. Hey, I've got a mutiny on my hands. Mutiny? Yes. It's time to buy school clothes and my three ragamuffins aren't sure of my choices. They agreed amicably. Lisa laughed. That's because you're not supposed to pick out girls' clothes. Ruth and Carrie nodded approvingly. So do I, Jake picked up on that. So they want you to come with us. Silence. Then I heard a snort. Really? she asked. Really. If you don't have time, they'll have to deal with me. No, I'll make time. When? Now. They answered unanimously. Did you hear that? I asked. Yes. Yes, it is. I could almost feel her smile. We picked her up and went shopping. It took all day, and I didn't see my kids having more fun. We got home and ordered pizza for dinner. They started trying on the things they bought, and we had a big party. It was getting late, so I asked Lisa if she was ready to go. She looked around. The kids were still goofing around and eating what was left of the pizza. Not really, but I guess we should. Okay, kids. I'm taking Lisa home. Take a shower and go to bed. You should all be asleep when I get back. We drove to her house in silence. I walked her to the door. For the first time in years, I initiated a kiss. Thank you for today, I said. Anytime, she touched my hand and smiled. Then she stepped inside. I waited a few seconds before ringing her doorbell. She opened the door immediately. It was as if she'd been waiting for it. Can I ask you a question? I asked. Of course. 
Why don't you wear taboo anymore? She looked at me, tears welling up in both her eyes. She took my hand. Come with me. She led me into her bedroom and dropped my hand. She walked over to her dresser and opened the bottom drawer and pulled out a box. She put it on the bed and opened it. It contained our wedding album, her rings, her marriage certificate, and a stack of letters. Last in the box was a half-full bottle of taboo. I sealed this bottle the day I asked you for a divorce. It was your perfume and the bottle you bought for me. I haven't used this or any other perfume since. She put the bottle back in the box and put the box away in a drawer. I'll wear them again when you ask me to. I took her hand and walked to the front door. When we reached it, I opened the door and turned to face her. I took both her hands in mine. There's a concert Friday night at the JCC. I'd like you to come with me and wear it. She looked at me. Her eyes got big and she started to cry. I don't remember her ever crying so hard. I didn't know anyone could have so many tears in them. She couldn't stop, so I went back into the house, closed the door, and hugged her. It took her a long time to stop. When she stopped, she reached into the back right pocket of her pants and pulled out a handkerchief, which she must have remembered I always had. She stood and wiped her eyes. Really? She asked. Seriously? You're not kidding? I'm not kidding. Should I take an overnight bag? She asked the question in a way that almost begged me to say yes. I smiled. Just a toothbrush? You won't need clothes. She swooped down on me and sealed me into her front door. Friday afternoon, I stopped by to pick her up. She was beautiful, and she was wearing taboo clothes. The trip was peaceful. The symphony was... Well, I don't know what it was, because I wasn't paying attention to it. I was just looking at Lisa, who was looking at me. About 20 minutes into the program, she leaned over to us and whispered, You know, we don't have to listen to all of this. I whispered back, I know. But the anticipation makes it even more exciting. I'm tired of the anticipation. I want to make love to you. My panties have been wet since we left the house, came from the row behind us. Get a room, boomed from the row in front of us. Good idea. I stood up, took her hand, and we walked toward the exit. Thirty minutes later, we were in our room. I was shaking. She was shaking. It seemed like the whole room was shaking. I went over to her and put my arms around her. Would you like some champagne? I asked softly in her ear. No. All I need is you. We had good sex. Finally. Dinner was over. I have to go, Lisa said. I'll walk you to your car, I said. I tried to take her hand as we walked to her car, but she pulled away from me. I opened the door in front of her, and she turned to face me. I thought it was me, but it wasn't me. It was her. You didn't want me. You wanted her back. That's why you asked me about the perfume. You just wanted a piece of her back. That's not true. Of course I like... No, I adore that perfume, but you were the first to try it. For that matter, I probably liked it because of you. She got into her car and drove off. A whole month went by and she wouldn't let me talk to her. She blocked my number, and a couple times when I went to her house to try to talk, she wouldn't open the door. One time, I saw her at the mall, but she had gone the other way. The kids couldn't understand it, and I couldn't explain it no matter how hard I tried. One Saturday night, the kids and I went to the movies. It was some girly movie that Ruth and Carrie wanted to see, but Jake and I were afraid to. The movie hadn't started yet, and the lights were on in the auditorium. Isn't that Lisa? asked Carrie. I looked over and she was walking down the aisle to her seat. She was followed by a man who sat down next to her. Yes, it is, I said. Can we go say hello? she asked. I don't think so, honey. The lights went out and the movie started. Whenever the light from the movie got bright enough, I looked over to where she was sitting. One day, I saw them taking turns sucking through the same straw in the drink glass. When the movie was over, we walked out. The girls gasped in delight, and Jake pointed his finger at his mouth and made gagging noises. In the hallway, Lisa and her companion spotted us. She came up and said hello to the children. She did not introduce her companion or speak to me. As they were leaving, I heard him ask who we were. This is my ex and his family, she told him. Life went on. Christmas vacation had just begun, and I was trying to finish my Christmas shopping. My mom, my brother and his family, and my sister and her family were all taken care of but I still wanted to do more for my kids, so I walked around the mall. I found myself in the only men's store in the mall. There were several stores for women, but only one for men. I looked at the suits because mine were old and a little worn. The salesman walked around me. I didn't need anyone for that, but I didn't bother stopping her. After I saw everything I wanted, I thanked her and started to leave. Lisa was standing by the big open door as I was leaving. I started to just walk around her, but she spoke. Found something you like? Why do you care? I kept walking.
She was close enough to me that I realized she wasn't wearing taboo. Do you want to talk? She asked. I don't think we have anything to discuss, I said, continuing to walk. You said enough when you accused me of not wanting you, but wanting Connie back. If you want to talk, you can talk to your boyfriend. He's just a friend. A good friend, apparently. Good enough to share a straw with him. She was still a step or two behind me, but she caught up and grabbed my arm. What are you talking about? I pulled away and kept walking. I saw you in a movie using the same straw to drink your drink. He dropped his glass and we shared mine. What's wrong with that? Casual friends don't do that sort of thing. That's what close friends or lovers do. She stopped walking. I haven't. What are you saying? You heard every word I said. You're smart. You understand English. I continued walking. She hurried to catch up with me. You're accusing me of... I stopped and turned to look at her. Are you having sex with him? What? Are you hard of hearing? What right do you have to ask me that? When I had asked her at the lake how many men she had dated since her divorce, she had answered without hesitation, but now she was defensive. I have no right to do this, but I thought we'd gotten to the point where... Ah, shit. I have to go. And I turned to leave. She grabbed my hand and stopped me. I'll sleep with whoever I want to sleep with. Do you understand that? I don't belong to you and never have. You're right. I've never been in love. You always slept with whoever you wanted. Even being married didn't stop you. I stood up, took her hand off mine, and walked home. The kids and I had a very nice Christmas. Matt and Rosa were invited to a neighborhood New Year's Eve party. They asked me to go with them, and I, which was completely unlike me, agreed. We had only been there a short while when Lisa and a man I recognized from the movie showed up. I told Matt I was leaving and explained the reason. Jesus, Michael, are you going to run away every time you see her with someone? Grow some balls, boy, and get back in the game. It was the best advice I ever received, and I followed it. I grabbed a beer and started walking in a circle. Eventually, I found myself in a small group, and we were joined by Lisa, who appeared to know most of them. They had no idea that Lisa and I had a history, and we didn't let on in any way that we knew each other. How's Timmy? Someone asked. He's fine, Lisa replied. He's over there drinking. Is he a keeper? One of the ladies asked. I didn't look at her directly, but I felt her looking at me, so I turned around. Our eyes were locked on each other when she replied. I guess, for someone, she apologized and left. They seem like a cute couple, someone in the group said. Yeah, but something's not right. Timmy's a little upset. He likes her, but apparently she has some doubts and he doesn't know if he should wait. He says she treats him like a brother. Hang-ups? Which ones? It's like he's never been to her house. They've been dating for a while and he's never been to her house. Yeah, but I bet she's been to his place often enough, one of the guys said, and the men laughed. The women didn't laugh. You asshole, one of the women said and slapped him on the arm. You men are all the same. Didn't you hear what she just said? She said he's probably a kept woman for someone. That means she's not interested in a long-term relationship with him and is probably carrying the torch for someone else. It means she's not sleeping with him. Oh, shit. Unrequited love. The worst kind possible. I feel sorry for him, said someone else. But that doesn't mean they don't have sex, another person added. She doesn't have sex with anyone else. She's been my friend for a long time and we work together at the hospital. Every now and then she starts crying and neither of us know why. Personally, I think it's because of her asshole ex-husband. She still loves him and he must treat her like shit. How do you know that? intervened I. I don't know exactly, but I know she has a picture of him in her work locker, and oh my god, it's you. You're her ex. They were talking among themselves and glancing at me furtively. I left them and headed for my car. On the way out, I passed Matt. I'm leaving, I told him. Lisa and Timmy were standing at the kitchen counter with another couple. Our gazes met as I walked past them. I was almost to my car when I turned around and walked back. I walked over to them. She was just wiping her eyes. Excuse me, but I'd like to talk to you, I said to Lisa. Why? To accuse me of sleeping with every man in town? I just want to ask you one question. A pause. Please? I'm sorry, Timmy. I'll be right back. We stepped out onto the sidewalk. That's far enough away. Ask your question. Actually, there are several. One. Do you have a picture of me hanging in your locker at work? She looked back toward the house. Well? Yes. She turned away from me. Why? There was a long hesitation. This is important, Lisa. Please answer. She turned to face me. Because I love you. Then why didn't you tell me? Because you're an asshole. Okay. I'm an asshole. But I'm an asshole who loves you. 
Her eyes grew huge for a second, then narrowed. I don't know whether to believe you. It's true. You accused me of sleeping with Timmy. I don't care anymore. I cheated on you, and another man got me pregnant. That was long ago and far away. Once you forgive me, you can never bring it up and throw it in my face. I've already forgiven you. There, on the street, she pounced on me, just as she had at home. We hugged and kissed. Two cars drove by and honked their horns. She placed her hands on the sides of my face. The last man I slept with besides you was the one I told you about at the lake, one of the three men I've dated since my divorce. Timmy and I are friends. Nothing more than that. He wants more, but I can't and never have been able to. We started walking back to the party. Timmy was standing in the doorway. We walked over to him. I'm sorry, Timmy, she said. I understand. He looked at me. I assume you're taking her home, so there's no reason for me to stay here. He walked away. The party took an interesting turn when Lisa and I entered the hall hand in hand. There was a lot of whispering and pointing. When Matt saw us, he just started laughing. We stayed about 30 more minutes. At midnight, we lay in her bed and engaged in our own stroking. She became an almost regular guest at our house, but she never slept over, and I never slept over at her house. Except, of course, on weekends when the kids stayed overnight at one of their cousins' houses. Depending on what shift she worked, Lisa and the girls often cooked dinner. And on those nights, Lisa usually stayed up until midnight. She worked nights, and one morning after her shift, I picked her up from work and brought her to my house. It was Saturday morning, and the girls had made breakfast for us. After the five of us ate, Lisa and I did the dishes. She stayed up for another couple hours. I could see how tired she was, so I took her to her room and told her to get a few hours of sleep. I closed the door and turned to go back into the living room. Ruth was standing there. Do you love Lisa? She asked. What do you want, Nosy? Answer my question, Dad. Okay. Yes, I want to. Bigger than Mom? Oh, God, no, honey. That's a different kind of love. How is it different? Let me try to explain this. I paused, took a deep breath, took her hand, and walked down the hallway to the living room, talking as I went. Do you love your brother? Of course. How about your sister? Don't be silly, Dad. Of course I do. What about me? What about your grandfather? What's your point, Dad? I mean, we can love different people, and that love takes different forms. But that doesn't mean we love one person more than another. It just means we love them in different ways. Do you understand? I guess so. Being an adult sucks so much, doesn't it? Only if you let me. I laughed. Lisa slept until noon and then spent the rest of the day with us. Late in the afternoon, I drove her to the hospital so she could get her car and drive home. The next morning, I heard Ruth and Carrie talking before breakfast, but I couldn't make out the words. As usual, Jake was only interested in breakfast. Ruth and Carrie came to breakfast. Carrie spoke first. Are you going to marry Lisa again? She asked. I wish I could, but a lot depends on the three of you. Why us? Asked Ruth. If I ask her to marry me and she says yes, it will mean she will move here and live with us. Would you sleep in the same bed? Asked Carrie. Of course they will, Goosey. Married people always sleep together, unless they're mad at each other, Ruth said. How do you know that? I asked. Dad, she said as if I was the world's biggest dumbass. How many kids at my school do you think live with both birth parents? I shrugged. Less than half. Don't they teach you stuff like that in college? I must have missed that class. I flipped through. Little Jake spoke up. If you marry her and she lives here, does that mean she'll be cooking for us all the time? At least part of the time? I told him. But we'll have to do our part. She'll be a wife and stepmother, not a housekeeper or a slave. I don't mind, he said. Ruth and Carrie seconded his words. The kids and I spent a whole week picking out a ring. I thought about getting her old rings out of the jewelry box in her room, but decided it should be a fresh start with a new ring. The day we bought them, Ruth called her and asked her to come over. When she arrived, the three kids ran out into the driveway and almost forcefully dragged her out of the car and into the house. They took her out to the middle of the living room and told her to stand here and don't move. Then they just stood there waiting for me. What's going on? Asked Lisa. Daddy wants to ask you something, little Jake said, almost choking with laughter while his sisters tried to shut him up. I sat in my room and tried to calm down. There was no doubt in my mind that I wanted to marry her, but one remark of hers made me think. When you forgive me, you'll never be able to bring it up and throw it in my face. It was true. My parents taught me that once you give someone a gift, you can't take it back, and it's none of your business what they do with it. If they want to give it to someone else, they are free to do so. They also taught me what Lisa told me. Once you forgive someone, no matter what they've done, you can't take it back and you can never remember it, so you better make sure you really want to forgive them.
as little Jake once said. I don't mind. I walked into the living room, and she stood there looking at my three troublemakers, wondering what was going on. Or maybe she knew, or at least suspected. After a few seconds, I made sure she guessed nothing, because as soon as I got down on one knee, she fainted. I never asked her because as soon as she came to her senses, she started saying, yes, 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 yes. The wedding took place five months later. It was the third time her father married her. The second time, he gave her to me. I don't want to do it again, he said at the altar. You don't have to, I told him. It's forever, I smiled, looking at her and breathing in the scent of almost 20-year-old taboo.